much for the introduction, and it's a pleasure to be in Edinburgh again. Um, some of you I recognise from the audience, and you will have heard some of this material before. However, I have far too many slides, so I'm going to skip over some. I do apologise for that, but I've been travelling rather extensively, and uh, preparation time for this talk is remiss and rather less than I should have given it. So I'm going to be around afterwards for any fill-ins and questions afterwards. Uh, so, to move on quickly, Valorex is a life science company focusing on cancer, therapeutic developments, and takes a proprietary position in various technologies. It develops them, usually acquiring them from a pretty early stage from academic or commercial laboratories, uh, developing them through to a certain point in the clinical stage, having done all the preclinical work that's required to license them, and then turn them into clinical applications and for other people to take them to the market. So our exit point of drugs is not selling boxes of pills in the chemists. It's selling to other people who will do probably that, although most, of course, are hospital-only applications. Uh, all our technologies come with fairly good pedigrees, often at a fairly early stage. I won't spend time going through them all, uh, but up there are the major, both academic and quasi-commercial partnerships we've had in the last few years. Where do we sit? As I've said already, we take stuff quite early. Now, it's the academic end of science and bio biology and drug development. And then there's the biotech and the pharma companies region, now, the pharma companies are extremely good at marketing, late-stage development and selling, and have vast teams and armies of people doing that in some cases, and even the smaller ones are relatively big and focus on late-stage stuff. The one thing they're not desperately good at over the years is filling in between academia and the late-stage clinical uh, thing. And I give a slight aside here. AstraZeneca used to have a very large facility up in Orderly Edge, in the 30 years they ran it, they produced 19 products from it. Since it's been set out to biotech companies, 35 products have come out, and that's in six or seven years. So the productivity in this space is poor in the big companies. There are plenty of reasons for that, and it's not the place to go into it. We have a string of assets in development, two in the clinic, and two preclinically. Val 201, which is for prostate cancer, and I will talk about more extensively in a minute, is doing very nicely and has passed some serious milestones in the last few months, which I'll come on to. Val 401 is a drug for lung cancer in the first place. It's completed a conversion from its previous use into a cancer therapeutic and is in the position of being partnered with others to take it through to late-stage clinical, according to our normal model. Val 301 is for another indication, and I'll come on to that if I have time later on in the talk, and it's for endometriosis. That is getting ready for the clinic now, all the pre-workup information, which is an enormous amount, particularly if you're treating young, fertile, or want to be fertile women in terms of regulatory and safety is now complete. And Val 101, which actually is the product that originated the company, it's a gene silencing technique, which is now at the point where we are getting it to the clinic. It's taken a very long time to do, partly because it's um, bordering on genetic engineering. It is not, and it's taken an enormous amount of time to get uh, legally and regulatorily agreed. I won't say approved, because technically that's still to be done. How do we manage this program? Well, Valorex is the quoted company on AIM. Underneath, we have our Brexit uh, lifeboat called Valorex OY, which has licenses to manage most of our intellectual property. And if by any complete disaster, EMA and the regulatory regime no longer exists, we will quite simply flip the management of the company to Finland. It won't make any difference in practical terms. Underneath that, we have three companies that are operational and one that is a holding company for intellectual property and various licenses. That's Valorex Bioinnovation and effectively is just a holding company of 
of intellectual assets and some real assets as well. Valley Sark, and there's a reason behind the names which I'm not going to go into, manages all the Val 201 intellectual property, the trials and other such management activities. Uh, Valley Endo, which will take the 301 entity on, is in formation at the moment. And Valley Seek, which is only 55% owned by us through, due to history, is where the lung cancer product is. Previously, we've had various other companies, and three of any real significance sit below there. Valley Bio was a collection of diagnostic uh, technologies which had arisen out of various of our therapeutic programs, which was developed in Belgium. And in 2010, it was sold through as an independent entity to a group of Australians, uh, which still exists. It's traded on the over-the-counter market in the States and is resident in Singapore, I believe, although I know little about what it's up to these days. It gave us a good return for money. We spent 600,000 euros on it and got two and a half million back within 18 months, so I thought we did quite well on that one. Not enough money for a therapeutic company, though. Valley Medics was the trading wing of Valley Bio. There were various products which were OTC in origin and use, and we had that to look after those products. And when Valley Bio was sold through, they didn't want the trading wing, and we sold it back effectively to an enhanced version of its own management. Um, we still have certain revenues due from them, although they are tiny these days and the product range has changed. And Valley Finland, Valorex Finland, contained a gene monitoring intellectual property set that was used for diagnostics. It was sold to a German company some few years ago now in that it was surplus to our requirements and was taking far too much management time. Right, a lot of programs to manage. This is not the BOD, and I do hasten to add that because people often get this wrong. We have essentially four people managing two clinical programs and two preclinical programs. If we were Roche, to take another name, uh, each of those people would head a department of 30 to 40 people. We don't. We are just that team. I'm not going to read out everybody. We're ably supported by Kumar and Tarquin, who sit at the back there. Kumar is full-time with us. The other people are all part-time. So company has about 12 full-time equivalents employed at any one time. The rest of our time is spent managing outsourced facilities and staff on any program at any one time. We may have up to 50 individuals involved in those programs. So it's a essentially a project management company, if you like, more of a consultancy type in style. How do we actually manage it? Well, this is the big issue. And quite often it seems as though we're doing very little. That's not actually true. It's uh, quite a serious operation to keep that number of people working. The way we do it is by having a very clear and distinctly defined set of program parameters that are easy to, complement, uh, to comprehend by the various implementation teams and the various outsourced people. Coupled with that is a very clear negotiated and contractual understanding of what the roles and responsibilities of these people are. Because we have done something that's quite unusual here. We have not taken on what they call a clinical research organisation to manage the programme effectively in our name. We decided a long time ago that early stage trials, which these are, are much better managed by the people who understand what they're doing with the particular compounds and the particular projects, rather than relying on people who have a generic understanding and probably good project management skills. So we rejected it in form of, in, in form of using a collaboration of a number of different suppliers for each programme. Quite often, they are in fact competing companies, but we've had no problems whatsoever by getting people who are quite often antagonistic to each other due to their competing roles in the marketplace working together very happily on our programs. It's actually added a bit of frisson and means we've got a lot done where otherwise we would have had trouble in that other people would have objected to what we do. Key to this, of course, as in anything, it's a people business, like all businesses are, it's communication, firm, clear and open. In other words, no dogmatic positions even though I can be. Personalities have to be accepted. We're dealing with highly skilled people who have strong opinions. 
you have to be understood and well respected. Corollary to that is you do have to delegate to the people who know better than you do on any particular form. We came up with the phrase a guardianship and it's key. Whenever we manage a clinical program and we have to do this to the highest of regulatory standards, we maintain a very, very strict register and control on who does what. I'm not going to go through all the other things. They're all the things you would expect, except to mention there were some serious regulatory changes introduced into the industry. Um, we've known about them for some years, but they came in in May, June this year. ICH, uh, R2, or so ICH 6 R2 guidelines became mandatory. Basically, this meant the sponsor, which is us, takes full liability for everything. Now, we always had that in practice, but quite often people didn't particularly like sharing their own dirty washing, even if they were contracted by you and you knew someone was failing. Now, we have the absolute legal right and duty to monitor, so we use a lot of auditing and going into our partner companies. Surprisingly, it's not usually antagonistic at all, and it's a very effective management tool. Now to move on very quickly to the projects. I've only got 10 minutes left, so since the talk will be available, and um, quite a lot of you have heard it before, I'll say VAL 201. It's a first-in-class therapeutic, which is shown to be safe, well-tolerated, and effective in the early stage of the trials against advanced prostate cancer. Now, this is the cancer which the normal therapy in the early days is to give you the female hormone pill. Bob Monkhouse is perhaps the highest profile person who died of this. Um, we have a nice product here. It's unique in its action in that it has the same effect as estrogen, except it also kills the cancer to some extent. How much, we don't know yet. That will come. There are others that target a similar area, but they don't just shut down the cancer. They shut down full sexual function, bone growth, respiratory function, and neural growth. And there was a certain person who was accused and found guilty in this country of blowing up a plane over Lockerbie. He was released because he had less than a year to live and sent back to Libya. He actually lived for four years. But if you noticed, when he left prison, he walked up those airplane steps really quite well. Next time you saw him, he was in a wheelchair. Next time you saw him, he was lying down. Next and last time you saw him, he had a face mask on, breathing oxygen. That's because of the treatment he's on. It's one of the modern ones. It's called Aparatro. Beautiful drug. I wouldn't take it. Mode of action, again, not going to go through that. No time for it, not relevant. The stuff works. As my CEO would say if she was giving a presentation, this is preclinical data as it happens. Invest on the red line. That shows no cell growth whatsoever in the right circumstances. Also, interestingly, with prostate cancer, you end up with metastatic cancers, usually in the bone, quite often in the brain, and not infrequently in the liver. Those are what actually kill you. We had an experiment, and it was almost an accidental experiment, where we had some spare animals, and we let them run on, having been given human prostate cancer, and we treated them. I wanted to see what would happen with the metastatic growth. As you can see from the graph there, we got a much reduced metastatic growth. We haven't seen that in humans yet, but then we haven't run the study with people for five or six years to know whether they're going to progress into that or not. However, we know what the mechanism is there, so we have hope. Again, all that information got us through to a nice clinical trial. It's a classic, classic cancer trial of dose elevation. Once you've done that, you escalate the dose with the individual, providing you've shown safety and tolerability, and you begin to range what a therapeutic dosing would be. Now, we've got exceptionally good safety and tolerability. It has taken us until now, two and a half years after dosing one patient after the other and following them through for four or five months before the next one could come along or the next group could come along. We finally, and much to my relief, managed to get a serious adverse event that is related to the drug. So we know we've got to the limit 
of where we can dose an individual in one dose. Poor guy. He's like me. He has quite severe hypertension, and he's had a cardiac uh, intervention as well. Joined the club. Not pleasant. And about an hour after he was given the dose the first time, he had quite a spike in his blood pressure. Easily treated, but because he had a rather longer stay in the clinic than he should have done, it's counting as an SAE, a serious adverse event. And since we hadn't necessarily expected it, it's a serious unexpected serious event. <laughs> a SUSAR, as they're called. <laughs> the thing is full of acronyms. The method, as I've explained, so I won't waste time on that slide. What are we seeing? Well, we started off with no drug at all. Uh, surprisingly, the very first patient actually showed an improvement in his cancer. Now, the others in that group were reasonably good as well. We showed stable disease before they finished the trial. The moment they came off the drug, all of them had, bar one, an increase in their prostate cancer growth. We've gone up the doses, we've seen more and more effect. Um, I can't talk too much about the most recent one, which is a big dose increase within the, comp within the individuals, except to say that we now have a very nice effect on his, what's well, actually the previous patient, on his um, PSA, which is the standard monitor, not the perfect one, but perfect monitor for PSA for cancer growth. And also on the right, you will see the levels of the drug we found within two patients. Uh, one, the most recent one, where if you notice it's gone flat top, so we've probably saturated his system with drug. And another one from a much earlier study at a lower dose, and they are dose response related. And they have what they call pharmacokinetics that are really quite remarkable for a peptide. Peptides normally you can't even measure because they break down so quickly. And this one has a half-life of getting on for three hours in reality. And uh, we wish to use it on a daily dose at the moment. We're doing it on weekly, and we are seeing good effects. So the clinical findings. Again, I'll leave you to look at these later. Suffice it to say, we're really <laughs> excited. Our phase one, phase two trial is coming to a completion, and it will probably be about three months later than we predicted four years ago, which considering that patients come through the door infrequently, the average recruitment at any site for any trial worldwide, don't let anyone tell you otherwise, is one patient every two to two and a half months. The actual figure is 0.52 patients a month per centre. So it's a very long and slow process, and I don't care who tells you otherwise. And there's some very clever statistics, which I saw last week in Berlin, bearing out what a disastrous time it is for companies, and not just us, everybody, and the patients as well, getting people to do clinical trials. And quite rightly, people are scared of them. Val 401. Now, this is... Again, I've got a very short time, and I'll finish after this one because it's important. We have shown that a mixture of an old drug, which has been used for a long time with a particular fatty acid, showed up the old drug's side effect to be useful in cancer. The side effect is that it killed certain people's cancer cells wrongly. By combining it with rumenic acid, we've now shown, and we know why, that it affects exactly the right point in one of the energy transduction things that you see in adenocarcinomas. It's been well discussed, both clinically and preclinically. And on the chart here, you will see a large number of independent review articles showing that this works and what its effects are. As I said, it has a very specific mode of action. The main thing that I want to show you, if I can find it, which goes on, is in a very small trial, while we're really testing that we could get the stuff in and make it work for people, we have shown that we increased the overall survival of the subjects who completed the course. Now, these are subjects who were dead by the time they walked in the door, had refused all clinical treatment <laughs> until they were persuaded by the medics to try this last one in that it was preciously little different as far as they were concerned to what they were getting. 
they had a longer life than the control group who refused to be coming on the trial in the same clinics. We also gave an overall slight survival advantage, but these people had no more than nine months to live by the time they came on the trial. So even the five or six weeks is significant. Quite a lot of cancer drugs are the great and the good that are being currently marketed heavily don't have as good a figures as that. <coughs> Again, figures will be available. And the quality of life of these people improved dramatically. They actually got up and started walking around again. They'd all been bedridden, not all of them, but a significant proportion. And we showed that the pharmacodynamics was slightly different to the normal formulation of this product, but not out of the kilter and out of the ordinary. So safety-wise and tolerability-wise, we've also covered the thing. This is being partnered with others for a full phase three trial. More to be announced shortly. We are in the late stages of negotiating the exact details of who and what and where and how on that. And unfortunately, as always with such discussions, it's taking time. Now, I'm not going to go through the others here today. Suffice it to say, again, they will be available for people to look at. I want to say the lung cancer trial has completed. We are in the process of partnering it. Hopefully, that will be done sometime in quarter one, 2019, but I'm not going to hold my breath. These people are difficult, and it's incredibly complex data. Prostate cancer trial is coming to a conclusion. The slated end date is June. A full readout will be there, and then we will be taking that forward to a much later stage trial, hopefully a pivotal one. The other two programs will be progressed. One, the endometriosal product should be getting to the clinic sometime towards the end of next year. There's a lot of work to do on that. Thanks for your attention, and I'm sorry that I couldn't give you a great deal more, but that's what I have. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, can I open it up to questions? Does anybody have a question? I think one in the second row there. Ethan George, if you could Ethan. choose to deliver three things in the next 12 months, what would they be? Um, uh, winning the lottery twice over, um, <laughs> Arsenal winning the cup. Uh, yeah, okay, right, let's get down to real business. Um, I would like to see 401 partnered away. Um, I suspect that will happen. 201, get this trial finished. After four years of since we started it, and three years since we started having people on it, it needs to go to the next level. And I now know what the dose needs to be those charts which I showed you there give a very clear indication. I can't say anything more because tomorrow actually is one of the review meetings that we're having with regulatory and independent assessors. Um, so that to, to the next trial. And the last one, quite frankly, I'd like to make some money out of 401. Do we have any more questions in the room? In terms of if I could ask a, a quick question, in terms of news flow, would it be possible to sort of summarise what, what people can expect over the sort of next six to 12 months? So I suppose it's... No, I can't go back to the slide. Yes, yeah. that last slide gives you where it is. And I've actually sure. put some indicative numbers there on there. Yeah. Uh, don't take them as full. Uh, I'm not going to swear to any of them. And if I'm wrong, tough is the answer. But yeah, they're pretty much what we expect. And I haven't put them on those because, frankly, going for science advice and regulatory advice and with... And actually, with Brexit, where, which science do we take? Do we do it with the MHRA, or do we keep well away from Europe and the whole thing and just let them settle down in case we have a complete cock-up? And I will say that. Um, I'm probably going to take 301 uh, away from Europe. Right. 101, it doesn't probably matter. It's such a novel product that it's going to take a long while to deal with. We've got another question in the second row there. Good evening, George. Good evening. <clears throat> uh, on the 401, <coughs> pardon me, part, uh, partnering, uh, the, the term late stage has been used quite a bit yes. over the last uh, six to eight months. Yes. Just how difficult is it? I mean, is, is Incredibly it? difficult. The reason for this is that there are four or five parties involved. There have to be because you've got to get the CRO involved on a risk share basis. They don't like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're used to being paid, not paying. Um, there's territorial arguments, 
between two of the other parties. And frankly, I'd like some money up front as well, although that's not the block. So it is just complicated. There are six parties involved in negotiating two different programmes that are being discussed. We're using one to leave with the other. It just takes time. Also, to be fair, a drug is a room full of paper. I mean, the, the, the actual trial master file for 401 takes up three metres of shelf space. <laughs> and that's just the high-level documentation. It's not the underlying. I mean, frankly, a terabyte drive is suffering. <laughs> yeah. And that's yeah, pretty much the complete data. But you try going through that. 15 different disciplines, 230 categories of filing. You start doing due diligence on that. It makes doing the channel tunnel look not particularly difficult. Um, one more question, I think, before we finish. Thank you. Uh, I used to work in finance, and in 2008, 2010, the regulatory bodies were a total pain in the neck. Mm. Um, how do you find dealing with yours? It depends which one. We have a number. We have the MHRA, we have the regional ethics committees, we have something called RSAC. Yeah, it is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Um, we also have EMA, because uh, they are ultimately where we have to go next under the system. We have the FDA, believe it or not, because we want to do something there. And frankly, you then have the regional and the individuals underneath it. Um, the best thing that happened to us was the International Committee on Harmonisations uh, Revisions, uh, sorry, 6, Guideline 6, Revision 2, which has given us, as sponsors, total responsibility worldwide in law. Yeah, scary at one level, but my God, the amount of power it gives you over everybody is immense. You just say, no, I have not seen that. I'm not happy. Frankly, most of the regulatory things come from in, internal to our team or our teams. We raise them more often than the regulators. Yeah, the things you can't do, you don't ask. <laughs> Excellent. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Morris. Thanks for that.